took you at AstroML, right? That's right. Okay. So, um, hi, I'm Jake Vanderplas, um, graduate student in astronomy at UW, working with Andrew Connolly. And I want to talk to you about something we've been working on uh, that we call AstroML, so it's machine learning for astronomy. Um, and, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we know that, we all know that Python is becoming kind of a standard tool for astronomy, and um, I think we, it's, it's pretty certain that it'll remain that way, at least for the foreseeable future. There, there are a lot of different um, projects that are, that are using it, that are built around Python. The, the one big one that I'd like to highlight is LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and many of you probably know what that is, but that will have first light in 2018 and um, operate for about 10 years, and, and the whole, basically the whole software stack is, is written in Python or in, in um, higher level or lower level languages wrapped in Python. So Python, I think, is going to be very important for the next few years, which can make, makes us all happy because we love it so much. But um, there, there are a lot of machine learning and statistical data analysis tasks in astronomy that are common between all, all s s different subfields. Um, I've listed a few here that, that come up often. Photometric redshifts, classification of sources, dimensionality reduction or visualization, clustering endpoint statistics. You know, there's any number of these things that um, you find in, in most papers these days, you know, with the, the size of the data sets that we're getting. So, um, yeah, every astronomer needs these sorts of tools. And um, the, the th cool thing is that existing Python packages have a lot of these, and they provide uh, really good, clean interfaces to, to a lot of those algorithms. But um, what I've found when talking to people who are, especially grad students and postdocs and um, people who are, who are studying astronomy right now is that they're not always aware that these tools are available or how to use them. Um, so for that reason, um, I've, I've, for the past year or so, I worked with uh, Jelko Ivesic, um, Andy Connolly, my advisor, and also Alex Gray. Um, Jelko and Andy are up at UW, and Alex Gray is down at Georgia Tech. And we've been working on this, uh, this textbook that I'm going to plug real quick, Statistics, Data Mining, and Machine Learning in Astronomy. Um, it'll hopefully come out early 2013. And um, what, what, what we want it to be is a complete practical guide to statistical analysis for astronomy. Um, basically, we, we want it to be something that, uh, that researchers in the field can use to brush up on the statistics they need in order to do their science. And also um, that people can use to, to teach. Uh, this is designed to be a graduate textbook. Um, it's an example-driven approach. We have uh, 180 plots in 180 plots and figures in this book, and each one of them will have the source code available freely online. So, um, you know, you, you go through and you see some sort of method applied to some data set. You can download the Python code and run the method on your own data set with, uh, with minimal trouble, hopefully. And it, it basically makes use of NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Scikit-Learn. And then for some of the more specialized tasks, it, it employs other libraries like PyMC for Markov chain Monte Carlo and uh, HealPy for some of the spherical hom harmonic transformations, um, stuff like that. And there are also a few routines that, that haven't been available in, in the Python universe yet. And for that reason, we created this package AstroML, um, Astro Machine Learning. So um, for the rest of the talk, I just want to give you, uh, show you a few examples of the kind of things that we have in there and uh, the sorts of uh, code that will be available on our website sometime this fall or in early next spring. So first of all, there's been this uh, interesting method that came out just recently by uh, Bovey and Hogg and, and some others that um, they called extreme deconvolution. And it's, uh, it's very much a David Hogg title for a method, I think. But it, it basically means Gaussian mixture models, GMMs plus errors. So here's a extreme deconvolution is something that they coded up and they wrote a nice Python wrapper for it. But um, you know, it has all sorts of dependencies and uh, you, have to, you have to install the C code yourself. So it gets, you know, it's tricky for some people. So our, one of our goals in AstroML was to make it only depend on NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib for the basic stuff because most people have that already. So we wrote a, um, a version of extreme deconvolution that runs in pure Python plus those tools. 
And basically what we're looking at here is, uh, first look at the top left panel, you see a color-color diagram of um, Sloan stars. This is from Stripe 82, so they've been, images have been stacked and it's very, very noise-free colors. So we, we see the color-color main sequence right here. And in, um, that's the top left panel. On the top right panel, we see the color-color diagram for a single epoch. So you, you can notice that this has a lot more noise in it. The, the locus there is spread out a lot more. So um, what extreme deconvolution does is it fits a mixture of Gaussians to this data set. And we actually fit the, the Gaussians to a four-dimensional co color space. We're only plotting it in two dimensions. And um, those Gaussians take into account the data errors. So uh, what, we, what you see in the bottom right in these ellipses right here is the, the fits of, I think it was 17 or 14, somewhere around there, Gaussians to this set, um, taking into account the errors. So we fit it to the, the noisy data. And then from that, we can do a sampling and we can draw out, uh, we can draw a sample of points that these Gaussians represent. And what we get is this bottom left plot right here. So hopefully you notice that the bottom left plot seems to have noise characteristics that are a lot more similar to the, the higher signal to noise data. So um, if we plot the width of that little locus going across right there, we see that the single epoch data is very spread out, very noisy. The multi epoch data has less noise and that this extreme deconvolution from the blue data, from the single epoch data was able to recover the tight, um, the tight locus on the color color diagram. So it's a, I think it's a pretty cool um, algorithm and it, and it has use for doing things like uh, calibrating photometric surveys. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey was actually calibrated on this data, on the, the width of this locus. So um, another thing that, that's useful is in time series data, we have lum scargill periodograms. So you're basically taking a series of measurements of something that you think is varying you look for uh, periodicity in it, you're basically fitting, fitting sine waves and cosine waves to it. And from that you can, find, you can find the period. So we have, these are from the linear data set. And I can't remember what linear stands for, it's something. Um, but it, we have a couple things like uh, some eclipsing binaries here. We have some other types of variable stars. And then up here we have something that's interesting. It's a, it's a double eclipsing binary and this shows where Long Scargle fails because it's actually it's uh, off by a factor of two in the period. It's both the minor eclipse and the major eclipse are found in the same place. So Long Scargle periodogram is another method that I, I think probably thousands of people have implemented on their own. But we wrote a fast Cython implementation and um, also a pure Python implementation that's a little slower. And we were able to analyze these linear light curves. We have about, um, I think, 10,000 of these, maybe more. Yeah, just 10,000 or so of these light curves that we analyzed. And from that, we were able to, to plot the um, various parameters. So we have the, let's see, the, the, the x-axis of the left column is the g minus i color. The x-axis of the right column is the amplitude. And then we have the period on the y-axis of both. And after plotting those um, and fitting a Gaussian mixture model, we were able to pull out clusters that actually represent um, distinct types of stars um, that are out there. So this is all, this is all just blind, um, blind machine learning or unsupervised machine learning. Finding, doing data exploration, we could, we could then go in and look at these clusters and see what makes them, uh, what makes them unique. So uh, another thing, uh, talking about clustering, this is the, the famous Sloan Great Wall data. We take the SDSS redshifts and we, um, we've projected basically a, a plane going out from, out from our vantage point. And we're looking at this, uh, this kind of line of galaxies that um, is known as the Sloan Great Wall. And you can do some interesting things with data like this, spatial data. We, um, applied a, a Gaussian mis mixture model from scikit-learn to uh, get a density estimation. Not sure how useful that is, but it's kind of interesting to see, uh, see what, it, what comes out of it. We applied the minimum spanning tree algorithm. If any of you saw my lightning talk a few minutes ago, this is using that um, sparse.cs graph um, stuff that's in the new version of SciPy. And minimum spanning trees are nice because they allow you to do hierarchical clustering. You can, 
you can cut off, um, you, you or order the connections by length and then cut them off sequentially. And um, other, other density estimation models as well. We have kernel density estimation and a, a few nearest neighbors space density estimators. So this just um, displays how some of these could be, could be used on a simple data set. Um, we also have, uh, you know, exploring different regularizations. I think I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time right now. But I just want to um, real quick uh, reiterate what our, our vision is. We want, we hope um, Astro ML will be more than just a, a code package that goes with this textbook. We really want it to be a uh, coherent and well-written set of examples, practical examples that astronomers can use um, in Python, that use real data, that use uh, whatever's available out there. And um, we want it to not only be a, a collection of examples, but off also be a standard repository for, for high-performance Python, well-written Python code that um, astronomers can use. And I, I really think this is, in a lot of ways, complementary to what um, the AstroPy people are doing. Because the AstroPy people, at, the AstroPy team is looking at all the, the basic tools that we need to access and manipulate our data. And we're going, uh, we're, we're standing on, on what they're doing and uh, thinking about how we can uh, mine the data for information and uh, do automat automated learning on that. And also, this, this is something I, I feel really passionate about, this letting, letting the cream rise to the top, so to speak. So if there's useful code in um, Astro ML, I think it should definitely rise upstream to something like scikit-learn. And the same thing if uh, scikit-learn is a package I work on, and if there's useful code in there, it should rise up to uh, scipy. And as you go up those, up, step up that ladder, it becomes used by more and more people. The development cycle uh, gets a little slower, but... Uh, and th this, this is something I've already done a little bit with scikit-learn and also, also with um, AstroML already. So, for example, the ball tree and two-point statistics were something that I wrote with astronomy in mind, and then uh, they were included in scikit-learn 0.10. The uh, minimum spanning tree that I showed you, uh, that started out for ast astronomy stuff, uh, ended up in scikit-learn and the, in the recent scipy, it's been pushed up there. And the bin statistics function, it's kind of, a, kind of a quiet one. You have to dig to find it, but it's in the new scipy. And this was something I actually wrote for our textbook in order to uh, visualize data the way that we wanted to. So I, I really think if uh, the community gets behind this and, um, and uh, and is able, to, is able to take part, this could be a, a really valuable thing, not only for the astronomy community, but for the scientific Python community in general. So um, with that, I want to thank you for the time. We, uh, I should say, that is a horrible color for the screen, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, github.com slash astroml. That's where this is going to reside. It's, right now, it's not there yet. I'm uh, hoping to do an 0.1 release maybe 0.1 beta release in the, sometime in the fall. Turns out right now I'm, I'm pretty busy getting ready for my PhD defense in a few weeks. So um, once that's finished, maybe I'll have a little bit of time. But uh, thanks very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Oh, yeah, bin statistics, it's uh, a generalized histogram DD. So if you've used the histogram function in NumPy or in matplotlib, um, instead of binning up and just counting how many objects you have in each, you can um, bin up your objects and then say, what's the mean value of another parameter in that bin? Or what's the median or what's the standard deviation? So it allows you to do things like, um, like um, HES diagrams and, and other interesting, interesting 2D plots with, uh, with a color giving you the value of a third parameter. Yeah, this, uh, it's uh, as many dimensions as you have memory in your computer, so. So, bins themselves can be basically Yeah, so you think about the bins as, as the most of your parameter space. Uh, if you, uh, a, a good example would be galaxies in three dimensions. Your bins could be the three spatial dimensions, and the fourth might be the uh, U minus G color of the galaxy and you can get the mean or the median of all the galaxies that are in each bin. And it's, it's kind of a generalized histogram in that way.
I think one more before we get to move Yeah. Uh, congrats on all this. It's really exciting. Oh, thanks. Uh, for seeing, uh, the first um, one of the things that I wanted to ask was about, you know, sort of new algorithms. And whether you're, if you're creating new algorithms, are they showing up sort of in the, uh, the literature first and then showing up in your book and then getting coded? Or, or most of what yeah. you're showing sort of already exists in the, you know, you know as, as far as fundamentally new algorithm, algorithms, we haven't done any of that. We've been implementing um, newer things that other people have done so far. Um, so but are you, are you benchmarking against R and R V2? That, that's one thing we'd like to do is, is, um, is provide some benchmarks. So the uh, answer is not yet, but hopefully soon. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks.